Welcome to the SB Grid YouTube channel. Software tutorials by developers. Lectures by structural biologists. Unique content brought to you by SB Grid. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the SB Grid webinar series. Today, I'd like to welcome Martin Stiegler who's joining us. He's affiliated with the university or the Seoul National University in Korea, but I understand he's actually joining us from the West Coast today. So it was never going to be a convenient time for him, but I, we appreciate him being here to talk about us. Uh, Martin got his PhD in computer science at the Technical University of Munich and is now an assistant professor in the School of Biological Sciences at Seoul National University. And he's here today to talk about FoldSeq. He's also involved with um, CollabFold is another tool that you may be familiar with that he's a developer on. So with that, Martin, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you again for joining us and agreeing to present. OK, thank you so much. Um, so he hello, everybody. Um, good morning. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about FoldSeq. Um, it will be more, more like a tutorial. Um, so I will give just a very brief, um, a brief introduction and in how the method method work um, and why we developed it. But I think I want to really focus on the command line and um, enabling you afterwards to use FoldSeq, like ultimately in your research. And and then yeah, please ask questions um, if you have any. And there, yeah, if something is really urgent at that time, we can just directly, hopefully, tackle it. And if not, there will be like question sessions also at the end. Okay, so structural alignments. Um, so FoldSeq is a structural alignment tool. Um, it's really like tackling the idea of like finding remote homologs. So here on top, what you can see is an um, amino acid sequence of these respective structures below. Um, if you try to align them in a like very classical way using BLAST or um, other sensitive um, alignment methods, it's quite challenging because between these two structures that look really, really similar, there's not so much conserved amino acid residues. Um, so here about 16% um, identity. It's really challenging to really define these kind of fits and evaluate if they are significant or not significant. But so now we have all of this like um, revolution in, in available structures or available predicted structures that we can now actually harvest and also search through. So whatever we have done with like amino acid sequences, we could now just do with um, protein structures. And this this field of like aligning structures is is a quite old field, and there's actually a lot of like really good software. Um, one of them is Dali, and the other one is um, TM Align, really highly cited and and widely used. Um, and they're they're producing really good structural alignments, but they have one problem. Um, they have a bit of a scaling problem with the current database size. So for this here, what we did, we searched with an RDP from SARS-CoV-2 against 800,000 um, structures in the AlphaFold database. Um, and with TM Align or DALI, that takes up to a, like a few days um, to a week. And if you imagine now you want to take a query and like a query structure and you want to search it through the whole AlphaFold database, which currently has about 200 million um, structures, it would really take um, years to, to get a result back. So with FoldSeq, we have built something like an unstructured aligner that can do the thing in five seconds. So you can search through this 800,000 in, in, in five seconds. And therefore it also scales to um, hundreds of millions of structures that you can then efficiently search through. So the main idea of, um, of FoldSeq is to turn a structure into a sequence. Um, but not just a, like, a, sequence that, a sequence that somehow expresses the structural features. And that is really crucial. I mean, there's a very straightforward idea to turn a structure into a sequence is to just read off the secondary structure elements, right? Um, and then you have a string that represents your, your, your structure with all of the secondary structure elements. But if you imagine you're searching a helix in a database, like the AlphaFold database, a helix just occurs everywhere. So it is not really a good pre-filter. It's not a good way of like um, um, capturing the information. 
And actually, you actually a lot of information is in the structured regions um, that are currently, if you just use secondary structure, for example, it's just represented as helix, 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 like H, 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 H. So it would be much better if somehow you could capture in an alphabet the um, three dimensional interaction between um, nearest neighbors um, or like some way of like capturing a neighborhood information. So we developed an, an alphabet that that tried to capture the nearest neighbor interaction. And here the nearest neighbor interaction means you try to um, you, you, you try to find a meaningful nearest neighbor in three dimensional space. And I'm saying meaningful because the nearest neighbor in three dimensional space is normally the adjacent left or right residue. Um, but it might be more, more beneficial to take some that is like one secondary structure element away. So we introduced this like virtual centers that helps us to find like meaningful nearest neighbors for alignments. So what we do is we have a residue, we want to turn them into a structural alphabet. We find the nearest neighbors here, the red one we want to discretize, the blue one is the nearest neighbor. Um, we are extracting features from the nearest neighbor and the current residue, um, meaning like torsion angles around it and the distances in between this nearest neighbors and torsion angles of the um, nearest neighbors. And we put these information into a vector. This is a vector um, with 10, 10 features. And then we have a, trained a small neural network that tells us for that, for these 10 um, features, what is the closest state um, that we would represent it in that state we call 3DI. Um, and um, it, it's really optimized using this neural network. And the way how you train that is you have an encoder and you have a decoder. So the encoder gets this vectors of 10. It has an information bottleneck in the middle. Um, and then it had the discrete space. And on the other side, you have a decoder that gets um, this like this bottleneck information and it tries to reconstruct um, the input from that bottleneck information. And if it can really do it efficiently, it means it has somehow learned to compress the vector space um, into a discrete space. So it's like a really fancy way of like clustering vector spaces is um, called um, VQVAE and um, some type of variational autoencoder. And then, so we do that for the for our our structures, and then we end up with just a sequence, right? And that sequence is now a sequence that represents the structure. And here, just as an example, again, this is the slide, the first slide I was showing. This is a sixteen percent sequence identity on the amino acid level. Between that, if you now replace the amino acid um, information with the three DI information, then you end up with a way more conserved sequence and that sequence now describes the structural structural features of these of these two um, um, structures and you can see that the sequence identity go up to like 54 percent and also the e-value that we are um, applying in Foldseek is a measurement of like certainty of of if something is random or um, not random it becomes quite certain that this is actually not random so you gain a lot of new information over using amino acid information and the advantage, as mentioned in the beginning, this is really fast, right? So now you can use all of these like fast search methods to actually use these strings and use them to align align um, structures. And so we decided to use our structural alphabet in MMM6. In the, um, it's, a, it's a fast tool for protein sequence alignment. So we tweaked the software um, in a way so it's, it's really tailored through its structures. Um, and the idea of that software is to find um, double diagonal K-mer matches um, of similars. So you try to find two consecutive K-mer matches. You break K-mer's meaning you're breaking the, these like st structural sequences into smaller fragments, and then you try to merge smaller fragments. And you want to see if they occur on the same diagonal. If they do, then you compute an ungapped alignment um, between them. Um, you're checking if the score of the ungapped alignment is meaningful, and if that is a meaningful score, you do a gapped alignment at the end, and um, so you're like really gradually decreasing the amount of sequence that you have to look at. So you have to be quite fast in the beginning because you have to go to 10 to the power of 8 structures, you have to go down to maybe 10 to the power of 5 for the second stage, and then 10 to the power of 3 for the, for the third stage and for the like final alignment, because each stage is like gradually getting slower and slower in compute. Um, it's much more expensive to do an, an gapped alignment over finding cameras um, between two, two um, sequences or structures. Okay, 
and some concept um, that I think is a, is a bit how we have implemented it in in Foldseek itself or the MMSeq as well is we have separated these two parts so we have a pre-filtering stage which is literally a module that you can call in the software that is called pre-filter and we have an alignment stage and so the alignment stage in Foldseek is swappable so you can just change it to something else for example if you prefer to use um, TM align you could use TM align or if you prefer to use the our 3DI and amino acid based alignment algorithm you could use that one and swap that in and but the pre-filter stays pretty much the same and the pre-filter uses the 3DI information. So you're pre-filtering this database, you find a list of candidates, and then you're aligning each of these using the respective um, structural aligner that you picked. Okay, that is pretty much what I wanted to give as an like base technical um, um, overview from the system. And I wanted to jump now into, into um, how to use false segment tutorial part. So, it would be now if you have questions a good part if you have questions about like more methodological points about fault seek and um, you could ask them now if not we can also do it at the end is there any question um looks like no question so far uh, okay Although i i do have i guess one one methodological question mm -hmm. so when you, when you were talking about indexing off the the compressed space for variable encoder that's mm -hmm. not being used as like a multi-dimensional index is that just because the sequence alignment approach works better versus like 20 still being too big for generalized mm -hmm. indexing yes it's expensive to store the you mean like just keeping the vectors um, and aligning the vectors is that what you what the question is yeah um yeah it is expensive to index them yeah and so if you have a sequence and you would need roughly a byte to store them somewhere right if you have a vector of 20 then it's turning into maybe four or two bytes per float times um, I think 10 10 we use um, and that per position right per residue and that becomes quite big if you want to scale that to alpha fold or like bigger databases you need terabytes of space to um, um, store that so it's just like not really feasible to capture the whole vector information and also a bit harder to index it yeah okay great and as as I was asking that, we had a few more questions come in. Okay. So uh, from from Nick Polizzi, we have a question about why only 20 or 21 vectors in the the, the quantized space? Is that uh, something space. tunable yeah. or is that? Yeah, it, it is a good question. I and mean, I get it all the time. <laughs> um, one reason for it is um, it, it's, it works technically very well with MM6, right? Because it's like very similar to an amino acid alphabet. So like just really from a comfortable point of view, how to implement it. Um, but we have also tested multiple other combinations with like higher alphabets. So you can increase the size and there was not much gain. So you didn't gain a lot of insensitivity. So there's a trade-off, like it makes it like technical feasible and indexable over um, you're getting a big alphabet and you end up with like really big Kamer tables and so on that you have to store. Um, um, yeah, that's that's the main decision. Thank you. And then when I think our, our last methodological one, is there a way to incorporate glycosylation information? Oscillation information? Uh, yeah. Glycosylation, like so post-translational modification. Ah, and I, yeah. I, I would assume you'd need to do a bunch of retraining, but yes, yes, we would need to retrain the alphabet to contain um, to contain that um, that information. Yeah, we do not have any way to currently do that. Um, I mean, we have all the code available for um, for the training, so it's like it's quite it's also quite cheap to train that because it's not a really deep network. It's it's very narrow, so um, um, it's, so everybody can run it on CPUs and retrain it. So you could optimize that alphabet for your purposes if you want to. Nice things about open source and scientific data availability. Yes, perfect example. Yes. <laughs> All right, great. That okay. Looks like the the last of the questions that have come in. Good. Then let's go into the tutorial part. So I will be switching back um, between between um, the slides and um, browsers or um, the terminal. So please let me know if something is not readable or if you have any issues on the way, so we can maybe adjust something. Um, will do. So the, the question here is like how to use um, Foldseek. So the easiest is obviously our web server. Um, for that, you don't have to install anything. Um, you only need a browser. And you can search through the majority of databases, um, like the AlphaFold database. And we have parts of the um, ESM Atlas, which is a metagenomic structural database, um, and um, the PDB. 
with the experimental structures. So you have all of them available in the browser and you can um, really create it. So I want to just talk a bit about what you can do in the browser first. Um, I hope everybody can see see my um, browser. Yep. Okay. Your, your browser is up, your mouse cursor is visible. And... Perfect. And um, so just from the querying interface, so you start off with something like this, and you have like a an, an search field, like a query field where you can put in a PDB file. You can just drag and drop a PDB file in, for example. You can also just copy paste the, the content of a PDB file um, into that, into that um, query field. Um, alternatively, you can push that load a session button that when you already know your PDB session, for example, or you know the alpha fold DB session, you can just type it in here and it will load that. So for the example I wanted to show, um, I'm using one Tim um, because that's one that I can memorize. Um, and if you load it, it, it loads that, that PDB file for you into, into that form field. You have then the choices here on the right side to pick what database you want to search against. Um, so in default, I think we are activating all of it. Um, and so you can see that there's this um, AlphaFold Uniprod 50 DB that is a clustered version of the AlphaFold database. So we have pre-clustered everything at 50% um, sequence identity to reduce the size of the database and to reduce redundancy. Because if if you would have if you search through the full alpha database, sometimes you get really a lot of redundancy. So that means your lists get extremely long. So um, we thought it makes sense to reduce it a bit. And then you have the Swiss prod and um, um, the alpha version of the Swiss prod and the proteomes. These are the initial published proteomes in July 2021, um, where there are 21 reference proteomes containing human and E. coli and yeast and so on. And they are not filtered in any way. So if you want to search through them um, like something human, then I would recommend searching against the proteomes. And then as mentioned, we have these metagenomic databases, this magnify database um, containing a lot of um, environmental structures, the PDB. And one um, is a also metagenomic database that we yeah, had just generated for a project. We will add, add more and more of this metagenomic um, structures over time to this um, server. Um, and then you have these two modes I've mentioned, right? You can swap in and out the alignment mode at the end, and the pre filter stays the same, but then the way how you align it differs. So you can switch it to 3DI amino acid, which is our default, which is um, the faster alignment method. And then there's TM align. Um, that is just how you know TM align runs TM align. <laughs> And you have a way to taxonomically filter. For example, you, maybe you're not interested in finding hits in the eukaryotes, so you could just, for example, type in bacteria here. Um, it should give you a list of the different types of bacteria that exist, and then you can just, for example, place that one here. And that will then subset all of the results, and you will only find the ones that are related to this taxonomical filter um, of bacteria. Okay, let's just do the search. So once I have everything in, you can just push search and then hopefully you get an answer. Um, I already searched that before, so the, the, the response time is faster than what you would see. Um, if you want to search against the AlphaFold database um, with a reasonably sized protein, meaning around like 350 lengths, it will probably take around 25 to 25 seconds to one minute, depending on how much hits you find. Um, okay, so now we switch to the interface where we can find the search results and um, here on the left side and um, you see the queries and since this and um, one tim has two chains you can see the hits for chain a and the hits for chain b so you can just switch through them by clicking on this and um, alternative you can just click on the top hit here um, for example if you're curious about the top hit um, it should bring you down to the list of the um, afdb proteomes and um, you can open that up that alignment and then you should see the um, superposed um, alignment based on our alignment. So we take the alignment information, we run the TM score module, and we're generating a rotation matrix and the translation, and, and then superpose these two, two structures. Um, some nice feature that you can have, because I'm always a bit confused how to navigate structures properly. I never know which residue is something. You can actually highlight, um, for example, certain parts in the structure. For example, you're interested in a certain region, so you just highlight it here, and then it should highlight that in the browser for you as well. Um, you can also see it in the full context of the query. For example, if you care about the other chain, um, you can just include the, the 
as well. So you can see how, how that alignment relates to it. And you can do the same thing for, um, for, the, for the query as well, for the target. And you can visualize the alignment, um, the aligned residues in three-dimensional space using these arrows. So we'd we'll be placing these arrows in, 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 in space and they are, should, should tell you which between the query and the target and um, which residues are actually aligned. Um, and yeah, you can also do that in full screen. Let's just do that. So you can see these, these small arrows here. You can see that this residue is aligned with this residue. Okay, and then if you are interested in this special like alignment and you want to use it somehow, you can download that PDB. So here you will get a PDB that um, is generated by, by C alphas, and we are interpolating the C alphas to get the backbones using Pulcra. So um, meaning that it's not exactly what you get from the alpha fault DB, um, aside from the C alpha information, that's literally what you have in the alpha fault DB, but we are interpolating the other, other residues um, so, but then you can just use it and open it in, in Chimera or any kind of other visualization tools and PyMol and, and play around with the structure. And yeah, you can also just download the PNG directly if you wanted to. Um, let me go back here. Let's see if I have explained more or less the things I wanted to say about the servers. Yes. Um, one feature that I want to also show, um, because I think it's 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 quite it could be quite handy if you don't have a structure at hand. Um, you can directly predict the structure in our um, web server, so you can place in a FASTA file here, and then once once that's a valid FASTA file, it will show you this like predict structure button here. You can click on that one, and what that does is it calls the ESM fold API in the background. Um, so the, the 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 team at Meta has like provided an API where you can get um, structure predictions. So we are sending that protein sequence to their to their um, service, and they return then the coordinates. Um, and then you can also search that against the database. So meaning now that was yeah it means you have quite fast turnaround times from a structure prediction to actually a search in the in the on the server itself. And yeah, that structure looks actually, you know, quite, quite well predicted. So one question that's come in regarding the, the web server in particular, when you mm -hmm. specify a PDB ID, can you also specify which chain to use? We don't have that as a feature, but that's a good point. Um, we should definitely have that. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we've also got a couple more method, methodological questions that have come in if you want to address those now or we can hold those till later uh, let's just do it at the end then with this methodological um um but as i mentioned as, as i've shown before with the search with the one tim the tim has two chains right and um, we are separating each search result by chains so even if you cannot specify it you can still click on the chain result that you're interested in and then you don't see the other one okay so so this is, I think, so this is really the straightforward way of like um, interacting with, with, with FoldSeq and just using that server. Alternatively now, um, if, you, if you are more, like if you have some experience with the terminal, then you can just install um, FoldSeq on your local system. Um, here I gave some like installation advice and what you can do, we have like static binaries. They are like whenever there's a new commit in the repository, we're generating a new binary that you can download. And the, if, you, if you want to use the newest version and you are not scared that we have introduced any bugs into that version that we currently work on, then you can just really take that static binary. Um, alternatively, you can also install um, things through Conda. Um, Conda. In Conda, we only have releases. So whenever we make a release, we put that into Conda. So you will, in general, get a more like stable or mature version. Um, to work with so you you can really decide what, what what's the best that, that you want we also keeping a version ledger of all of the different um, um static binaries so um if you want you can actually manipulate that link and actually get old commits as well um just just a bit of a back information if so if you really need an old version that was somewhere static somewhere and you cannot find it and um and you have a problem just let us know and um, we can just send you the link to that um, and then you can download it so Download is fairly straightforward. You just download it and then you unzip that file or untar that file. Um, 
and and you have binary in it like a faulty binary that you can use so so then once you have the binary then you you can just type in fault seek and then you can actually see a bit about what is possible with fault seek already i hope the um, font is big enough and um, if not please let me know so fault seek has a bit dissimilar dissimilar um, idea than the git one where you have git and then git add git commit you have these like different sub modules that you can call so fault seek is also composed like this and um, it is it is a software that has like many many small modules behind it and these modules are built up into workflows and i think the easiest to work with is our easy workflows so we have this like easy search easy cluster and easy rbh and they should really work quite straightforward it means you you already have a set of pdbs and you want to search it against the database that you have downloaded from foldseek then the easy search is the easiest you can do just type in foldseek easy search um with your with your pdb and the database and just push enter and you get like a result that um, you can interpret and today i'm gonna talk a bit about the easy workflows so but keep in mind if you really want to go like deep into full seek you could look into what modules are available and you could compose your own workflows um, and you can set up your own system in some way your own search um, your own clustering um, so keep in mind that it can be modular and you can do things with it um, so if you are interested in one of the modules, for example, easy search, you could type in full seek easy search, and then it will show you in, in default the parameters that we think are meaningful um, to change. Um, if you add in easy search minus H, you will see a long, 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 long list of all the parameters that are available. Um, it could be like really overwhelming. And um, so in default, I would just see what you can see here. And most of them are the relevant ones that you should want to tweak maybe for your search. Um, I'm discussing some of the like main main parameters that are relative to like sensitivity and um, and speed and the trades off between them in the in the readme of the repository. And um, one important one is this like minus s. Um, it's really adjusting the sensitivity. In default, we're setting it very high, like we we are being quite sensitive. But you might be able to increase it even further and find some hits that are even more remote. Um, but you're you're sacrificing time, so it just costs you more time to do so. And um, another one that is a bit of um, that can sometimes help for like increasing sensitivity is these max seeks. I have mentioned that we have a pre-filter and we have an alignment stage. Max seeks is something that affects the pre-filter. So it's like saying how much hits do you let through the pre-filter that are then actually aligned at the end. So you can imagine the bigger you make that number. The more you align on the other side um, and and therefore you can find more hits but if you really want to flip like if you want to really switch off the the pre-filter you could use this like exhaustive search mode and that will then um, skip that completely and aligns just everything okay that's just like a few for a few parameters i wanted to um, um, mention um let's just jump into the the search directly oh no one one thing before um so you have fault seek right once you have fault seek you don't have a database yet so now you have to like build your own database you want to search against. So if you already have a set of PDBs, it's quite simple to make a database. Database, um, you just call create DB and you point it to the folder that has all your um, PDB entries in it. But alternative, let's say you want to just search against the um, Swiss Broad or some pre-made databases. We have this um, get database command in in full seek, um, where you have a collection of like pre-set it up. Um, That was not good. Full seek databases. And um, you have this full seek database command. And in this one, you have this our, our preset database you can download. So you can download the full alpha full DB or the, the clustered one in the, from the server or the proteomes or the Swiss Broad I've all just mentioned before. And um, so you don't really need to download the alpha full DB as PDBs and build this database because it's really a um, quite expensive um, endeavor because you have to download like 25 terabytes of, of space. Um, but our databases are um, in generally much, much smaller because we only store the C alpha information. Um, for example, you wanted to download the, the Swiss prod. So you type in full seek databases here on top. It tells you what you have to do. Um, the name of the database is first and then the output name and that how you want to name the database and then a temp directory that we use for like building some scratch files on the fly to build the database so meaning if you want to have the um 
SwiftProt, you just say this is the SwiftProt database name. Um, I call it I called it SP. And then you write temp and you push enter and it will download it and set up the database for you. And it takes about three minutes. So I'm not gonna do it now. Um, I already did that before. Um, but what that end up with is you end up with and the database is described by like multiple files on the system. Um, one here is this SP, and then we have these index index files, and then we have an under underscore H, and we have an SS and and C S C A. Um, SP contains amino acid information. This here contains header information. This here contains the SS contains the um, 3D I sequence, and um, the C A contains the C alpha coordinates. So you can see that the C alpha coordinate storage actually much biggest space that you need in order to make these kind of searches. Well, the the yeah, amino acid size is around 184 megabytes. The C alphas need a gigabyte in space. And then we have also the taxonomical information. So internally, we are we knowing if something is a bacteria and so on. So you can use the taxonomic information for your searches. Um, once you have downloaded it, you can generate an index from it. Um, so that is a bit of a double-sided sort. Sometimes you want to make an index, sometimes you don't want to make an index. Um, an index means you are already um, generating a structure of k to sequence, like our index structure that we use for efficient searches. If you don't call create index in the beginning, then FullSeq will in, in, in default just generate an index on the fly. And that can be really useful if you have a computer that doesn't have a lot of memory, because we will then split the index into the correct sizes um, um, that fits into memory. While create index will in, in default just build an index that um, fits into the um, whole, whole system memory. So sometimes it makes sense to call create index and I think it really makes sense if you want to build something like a web server out of Foltik, where you just want to make like really fast, efficient single single queries, then you have to call create index and you have to keep it in memory. Um, but if you just want to do a batch search, you have like a hundred structures or so, and you want to search it against um, against the database, then um, create index doesn't give you a, a big speed advantage anymore, and um, because building the index is actually quite fast of of Foltik on the um, on the fly. Okay. Let's do some search examples. So I've mentioned the easy search. And um, so let's just search a PDB against our downloaded um, SwissProt database. Um, so we having we have four parameters here. First is our query. The second is the database you want to search against here, the SwissProt. Then the alignment output name. So um, how we want to call our result. And then a temp folder again for um, building like scratch files for the search on the way. And if you do that, um, Foltzik like, likes to talk a lot and um, it gives you a lot of output. Um, if you don't like it, you can actually set minus V, then you don't see it. Um, but it's a bit, it's educational in a way that um, it explains a bit what's going on behind. So um, first it takes the query here and it turns it into a database um, with CreateDB. So PDB turns it into a query database. Then it takes this query database and it searches the 3DI information of that query database against the um, 3DI information of the of the um, Swiss prod. And it pre-filters that, so it's our pre-filter. So it generates a pre-filter output here. And that pre-filter output is then given to the structural alignment module that um, just aligns the, the, these two sequences. And that's the result that is done returned. Oh, it's actually not the original return. This is the aligned result. We're then converting it into an easier human readable format with convert alias. So when you call easy search internally, it calls three commands in Foltzik, pre-filter, alignment, and then um, conversion. And so we can have a look at um, this file. So it is very similar than what you get when you would do a blast search. Um, for for for, for um, as a result, so it's a TSV separated file that um, shows you the query identifier, the target identifier in the database. It shows you the sequence identity, the alignment lengths. Um, it shows you how much gaps were opened. Um, it shows you the the start position in the in the query, the end position of the alignment in the query, the start position of the alignment in the target, the end position of the alignment in the target. 
and an e value that tells you how certain is that is this um, um, like how likely is that random or not random and a bit score at the end of the alignment um, and so that's that's all you get so you don't see much of a structural information at that point um, it just tells you this aligns and I'm quite certain that it aligns quite well um, so you can use that then to pull out these hits for example and investigate them further um, one thing that is I think quite powerful by now because we have added more and more of these fields is you can change the output fields that you want to see in the search um, so for example let's do the same easy search as before and um, but we are adding a parameter at the end which is called format output and then format output now in comma separated we are defining what fields we want to see in the tsv at the end so we want to see the query we want to see the target we want to see the identity so this is all the stuff that we have already have seen in the default output and um, some things i have just ended, added here at the end is that LDDT and um, alignment tm score so we can also compute the alignment LDDT and the alignment tm score and can add that as additional columns um, at the end of that alignment um, output so let's just do this search so we do pre-filtering um, alignment and we have our output we can now do head on oops head on ln2 and now you see that over the um, alignment let's go to form before we got some additional new columns um, that we have defined um, which is the LDDT um, and the TM score at the end as a final as a final column um, oh, and we have something more. We have a probability um, that I also wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, we added three fields, probability, LDT, and alignment TM score. So uh, Martin, quick quick question. What yeah. what do you, what are you, how are you using the alignment LDT score? Or like what is that? Uh, yeah. Um yeah, I was not sure if that is a thing. We have used it in Foldseek that we have invented uh, for um, the way to to score similar to what you would get from the TM score, but just as an LDDT. So um, you're considering all of the aligned residues between query and target. And then you get like this like local, local. you're comparing the local environment around 15 Amstrong about all of these aligned residues. And you're comparing them between query and target. And then you do the just normal LDT computation, like seeing how close are distances in like four Amstring, I think two Amstring, and so on, this um, this formula that is used for the LDDT. And the advantage of the LDDT, like why do we have that LDT is, it's a measurement of like local structural similarity. So it allows for domain flexibility and still gives good scores because you're comparing like the local neighborhoods that are actually um, aligned between these two sequences rather than superposing two position, uh, two sequences. And then, um, and then, computing a similarity from this like an RMSD or a TM score so you are not you're superposition free um so it is an, a measurement that can help you actually for something like the alpha fold DB but we will see a bit of examples I will show a bit about this um why LDDT uh, might be sometimes better or why TM score might be sometimes better to you so um please bear with me <laughs> oh, thank you Um, but before we're going into the LDT and TM score too deeply, I wanted to talk about this probabilities. Um, so you see this probability is one here all the time for all of the hits, um, meaning that we are quite certain that this is um, something that is homologous, so something that we have fitted based on SCOP. Um, and it should really help you to determine if hits that are quite remote to see if they are, if you would trust them or not. Um, so it, the, the probability stays one pretty much majority of time until you reach um, something about 10 to the power of minus um, um, three um, in, in E value. And then it's degrading. And then it kind of is an indication of like, how likely do you still believe that this might be homologous to something in, um, in the database? And you also see that the, the scores, uh, the, the, the order here is not necessarily by E value. We um, order it by the score. And so you see sometimes that e-values are a bit lower and higher between them, um, but they, are, they should somehow um, be related. But 
the more distance you get, the more different could be the score could be from the e values, and yeah, and hopefully then the probabilities will help you to figure out which one is the right one. Um. Okay. I wanted. Okay, I wrote here. We should check out this this example here. Um. Let's see. So there should be a hit here that we have found for um, our PDB file. And in this one, yeah. So what you can see here on the right is you have an, an alignment LDT score of um, on 0.8 and you have a TM score of 0.56. So the TM score is significantly lower um, than, than what you see with the, with the um, LDT. So now the question is, why is that? Um, so for me, that would be an indication for, for example, a conformational change or like some multi-domain rearrangement where one multi-domain is like quite different and you cannot superpose these two things properly. And therefore the LDT is actually quite high because it's superposition independent and the TM score is quite low. Um, we can have a look at that alignment and this is what we do, um, with what we will do next. Um, maybe you want to really see the three-dimensional alignment, right? And um, so we have an, an search mode and that's we call format mode three that um, gives us an um, HTML output. And this HTML output um, should have something that looks fairly similar to the web server. So you can just run that. And then you just open ALN3. Was it two? ALN.html, what do you call it? Yeah. Um, and then you end up with this search result. Um, so you can also click on, on each of these lines, it goes down and you can see the visualization of this. Um, I wanted to visualize that example where the LDDT and the TM score is different, which is this one here. Okay. And what you can see here in this um, in alignment is that in this called this a calmodium, um, there is a change here between red and white, right? And and so it's not really perfectly superposable. So and therefore the TM score isn't super high, but the, the 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 unit here on top is really similar, right? So if you would just rotate that, then you would end up in a very good alignment. So the LDT somehow gives you that. It just tells you that, yeah, if you would just move that part up here, then you would actually end up in a good alignment and, and therefore the score um, is, is high. Um, one more thing is uh, maybe you are interested in getting the, the, the PDB information, the superposed PDB information out. We have an alignment mode five that um, will turn the results into, into PDBs. So it will store each of the hits that you find as an, as a separate PDB entry. Um, so let's just run that. I will. I do not recommend to do this with like really large scale searches because you end up end up with like millions and millions of files. But if you have just a single query, it's doable. Um, so you will end up with many many files on your file system now. Um, each hit that you have detected in the database turns into a PDB file, and that PDB file contains only the C alpha information because that's what we currently store. We don't do any pull query magic here. Um, it is just the pure um, PDB information. Um, of the C alphas, and um, you can then open that, for example, in 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 Chimera or any other tool. Let's just do that. Let's just open one of the alignments. Oh. Okay, it doesn't. We can just use any other alignment. We'll just pick. I don't know. Just pick a random one. Okay, so we see some 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 um, some spaghetti, which are because it's only C alphas, it doesn't really have the secondary structure elements. Um, and I wanted to also include the query. Okay, and then you can just see that this is actually a not a great alignment, um, which, but you see there's just a some su small subsection that's aligned. And um, something that Falsy can do, it can produce local alignments, and this is a local alignment. So you can see that the unit here has an alignment between them, but it's not a global global structured alignment. So we have probably picked something that is quite below in the list, some hit that is a bit remote in some way. 
Um, yes, this is what I wanted. Yeah, one thing as well. So if you want to trigger the TM search, then you're just switching the alignment type. So meaning the pre-filter will stay the same, but um, you're now just getting the TM outputs at the end. Um, so just the same thing as before, easy search, you type alignment time one, and now it will do the TM align for you. And yeah, the, the alignment step takes a bit longer with TM align. Um, hopefully it's not too long. Okay. And then you get an output file. And in that output file now, um, instead of the E values, we are showing um, the average TM score between query and target. Um, and for the score at the end, we're showing the query TM score, um, but the rest of the fields are the same. And you can also, again, like add other fields if you want to with form format output and so on. Um, yeah, the exhaustive search I have mentioned, if you really want to skip the pre-filtering stage here and you want to just do an alignment against all of the members, just turn on exhaustive search and it will be much slower, but um, you will then hopefully not find, uh, miss no hits. Um, you can do alternative alignments. This does not work with the TM alignment code, but it only works with the 3DIAA mode. And that means if you have like a domain A and a domain B and the second protein has domain B and domain A, then you can't align them in one go. Um, but you can actually get them out by just searching for an alternative alignment. And here with this alt ali2 means you want to report up to two alternative alignments um, for, for, for the structure. Um, now, the last thing I want to just briefly talk about, you can do clustering of, of structures. This is still work in progress. Um, you can use the full seek easy cluster, and you can point easy cluster to a folder that has PDBs in it. Um, or if you want to just cluster a database, you can just use full seek cluster and point it to a database. Um, and it will then build like, like units where it fulfills certain clustering criteria. For example, saying that the alignment should cover 80% between both structures, like you should be nearly globally alignable, or you can give some similarity metrics. You want to only cluster things that have an like alignment LDDT of 0.5 or TM score of 0.5. So you can all justify that and, and adjust that and then do the clustering. And then you will get the clustering result, which is an assignment between the input structures and, um, and their cluster members just briefly how it looks like if you do this um it does a lot of steps it's cascaded clustering and um, means it's multiple times clusters subsets and subsets and subsets to be fast um because structural clustering is actually quite um expensive and um, computationally and um, if you have done the clustering you will end up with multiple output files um one are the representative sequences, meaning you can see how many clusters you have built here. So if you look at that, you will end up with two, two clusters that, that exist at the end. Um, and then one other file is the assignment file, which um, you can see as this cluster.tsv file. And the cluster.tsv file tells you um, member um, and representative member. So for example, the first one here is itself, right? So you're, you're your own member, the representative is its own member. And the second one um, here, you can see that you have um, the representative and the same the same thing as, as a member, but that is really a cluster. So all of these lines here describe members of that, of that cluster. Okay, so this brings me to the end of it. And um, one thing mentioned, so there is documentation for Folsig. If you go to folsig.com, you have to read me. That's a good way to just get started. Um, and it has the most important information in it. And since this is all built on, on the MM62 code base, you can actually just go to the MM62 wiki and see what kind of commands exist. And they should also exist in Folsig and should be able to call them. Yeah, and in summary, FoldSig is a, yeah, a, a, a structural alignment method that uses um, these 3DI sequences, I mean, discretizing st um, um, structures into sequences. It's quite fast. It allows to search through um, millions and um, hopefully also billions of structures. Um, it has e-values that are quite accurate, so you can trust them very similar as you can trust BLAST e-values. Um, it does these local alignments, so you can find sub-matching um, pieces. And yeah, it's open source and you can use it. Um, and with this, I would like to thank you. And please ask questions. Well, Martin, thank you for a great talk. And there were many, many questions came in.
So. Okay. <laughs> that, I don't know if it was a great talk. <laughs> oh, I, I, I thought it was at least, and you know. It's, <laughs> but actually, one one I guess maybe clarification or organizational thing you, you touched on it a few times. In terms of running FoldSeq, what are what are the biggest computational concerns? Is it CPU? Is it RAM? Is it the amount of storage you have? How fast your storage is? It's it's RAM. It's mainly RAM. Um, so the the most expensive part is that we are in the structural alignment part use the C alpha information. So you need to keep the C alpha information into RAM. Um, so for the Swiss prod that was 1.1 gigabyte for the um, Uniprod 50, it's much, much bigger. It's like 200, 300 gigabytes or so of space. If you don't have it in RAM, it will still search. You will still get a result, but it's much, much slower. So because then you fetching things from the disk and then it would make sense to put it on an NVMe or something that is like really fast with like random, random accesses. Um, so Currently, the C-alphas, for each amino acid residue, we have a compressed version of C-alphas. Um, we need two bytes for, then we need six bytes, so X, Y, and Z, each two bytes. Um, so six bytes per residue. So you can somehow compute how big a database would be in RAM by just um, using six times the residue size in the database. Yeah. Thank you. That's there's always going to be something that's a limiting step. It's just a matter of where where is it? Right, yeah. We're trying to reduce the memory requirements as much as possible. We're also thinking about how to further comp compress DC alpha. So um, we have some idea to probably still half it, but then it's over, then there's nothing we can do anymore. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you wait long enough, you're going to be able to get a computer with more RAM. So there's right. always the, that trade-off as well. All right, and moving on to non non computational questions mm -hmm. how how does fold seek handle dealing with a single chain that has breaks in it or gaps versus having two chains or more than more than two chains yeah so currently we do not respect residue index breaks so we just encode that as a single a single 3di sequence so if you have like a missing residue we just ignore that and it will be just put together and so you have to handle currently the mapping back to your resid um, residue coordinates in the PDB by yourself. Okay, thank you. And yeah, each chain each chain is processed as a one se separate search. So we search each chain, um, like search each chain against the database and report results for one chain at a time. I mean, that, that suggests if you have a gap, then you can just search your gaps, each side of the gap independently. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Is is there a practical lower limit for the the size of a motif that you could search? For example, if you've got like a reasonably short helix loop helix that you wanted to query a database, is that just not enough information to find something? Yes, there might be. So if it doesn't turn out that you have a lot of like, so if if you just have a straight coil or like a straight helix, or if you have something that doesn't have like it's not really structured, you can search it. But we really punish hits that goes through the pre-filter um, um, through that because it, it, it's just a random chance that you can find a helix somewhere in space. So it's, it's it's just occurring really, really frequently. So, but if you have like a small structured element where you can see like if helices and so on, and they're building something, like they're starting to build something global or then the search will work and you can find quite short things, but I wouldn't go below 15 residues. I think then it would be, become really um, hard for the software probably to pick things up. Thank you. And actually, just one one question from your answer: how How does it look when you search a sequence that turns out to be unstructured? I know that that's something where AlphaFold results for unstructured things will be mm -hmm. interesting. And yes. is that is that something that's easy to pick out in the FoldSeq results? Yes. So FoldSeq from the alignment stage, it, it doesn't care about like global positioning, right? It has like a local alignment and property. Um, so you can align them, but you will not be able to find some of these. I guess if something is just disordered and nothing else, then FoldSeq is not the right tool. Then you probably want to use something else. But let's assume you have a disordered region and a domain somewhere, which you often see in the AlphaFold database. It's like a very small domain somewhere in the middle, and then there's like a big, big ball around yeah. it. And um, so we would be able to pick up that domain and we would be able to align over the disordered region as long as the amino acid information provides enough information for it. Because for our alignment, we're combining 3DI plus amino acid information in the alignment stage. So we can go over these disordered regions to an extent until there is enough evolutionary information. 
Thank you. And then, so we, we've had a couple questions about at, augmenting the results, if it's possible to like group by gene ontology or function or add, you know, RMSD or some other metric. It, it sounds like those are things that would have to be done downstream. But right. And so, so we, we do have um, RMSD as an output um, in our, so I mentioned these like format output of um, um, we have fields that you can apply. I hope I have that here. I think we have RMSD as well. It's not updated. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So you have like the T and the U and the alignment score and the LDT and the C alphas. So we also have RMSD as an output. So you can just use that to um, sort your list, right? Just, um, um, but we have no way to get like functional, functional annotation. So we don't really work with whatever annotation exists in the Uniprod already. Um, yeah, for that, you need downstream analysis. Thank you. Let's see. I think, so I, I think the last question we've got is, could you talk a little bit more about creating a custom database with just a folder of target structures? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I, actually, when I presented, I realized that is something I have just totally missed. So good question. <laughs> um, so FoldSeq has this like create DB module. Um, and I have shown you before that we clustered these examples. Examples just contain some PDB files. Um, it's just a set of PDB files. So we just call it now um, our DB here, for example, and then it just builds the database for you. Great. Thank yeah. you. I think we're we're coming up on two minutes to go in the hour, and the questions seem to have tapered off. But if there are more, please feel free to send them in the chat. And until then, you know, Thank you again. I thought it was an excellent talk and I learned quite a bit and I had some fun playing around with FoldSeq earlier this week to get myself used to it. Oh, great. Thank you so much for using it. <laughs> and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it was fun talking. Yeah. Uh, we, we can't do the applause over Zoom or at least despite the advancements, <laughs> I still don't have a good way to do that. We can do the emojis, but it doesn't feel the same. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And See you.